and the day before. And the day before, and all the time. The Lord's wonderful all the time. Some humans are a little flaky part of the time, but the Lord's wonderful all the time. <laughs> Lord, if it, God, thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, now this is the last morning Brother Hagin instructed us, me and Ken Copeland, John Osteen. At the first of the week, he wanted to have faith taught on each morning. Then the afternoons when we spoke, well, we had one afternoon each, so we speak on whatever we wanted to. So my afternoon was Wednesday afternoon, Monday morning, and then Wednesday afternoon, then Saturday morning, and John had to get his one over with and go back to his pastor. So I spoke on worship on Wednesday afternoon, and I'm going back to faith this morning, but now then I'm on. I'm going to zero in on it this morning and so you can learn exactly how to take cases. The Lord showed me years ago, several years ago, how to take a person that's dying and no hope for him to live whatsoever. Not even one chance in 10 million for them to live. There is no hope for them to live. He, taught, he showed me how to do it, how they could live if they would obey what he said and they were still able enough to talk and would obey it and could obey it with authority. So this morning I'm going to basically teach you on that. The title of my message this morning is Faith with a Voice That Works. See, some faith don't work. Well, faith in God will work, you know, but you have to qualify that statement when people say, well, I'm, believe I'm just believing the Lord. I asked a fellow here a while, here a while back, his mother-in-law was in the hospital. I asked him, I said, is your mother-in-law getting along? How is she doing? He said, well, how is she coming along? He said, well, he said, if God don't intervene, she's going to die. Well, I mean, he's a Pentecostal preacher, you know. So, well, if God depends on you to pray for her, she, she'll die for sure. If God don't intervene, she will die. Well, God, I always remember this. God does what you do. It's not the idea that God intervenes or don't intervene. God, the Holy Ghost that lives inside of you, the Bible says that He, He, the greater one, is a performer. But the Holy Spirit works on the earth basically two ways. He works with a voice. He works with words, and he works with a voice. First of all, you have to remind God of what he's promised you in the Bible for your case. You have to remind him. Then the Holy Spirit's not going to do anything for you much, ever, if you don't hear a voice. Because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you is a performer. But he's been sent He's been sent to perform the Bible. That's all he performs is the Bible. Now, it's true sometimes that if, if you don't have a lot of faith in God, but if you go to church all the time and you have a saying amazing grace, because I was raised as Baptist, it didn't happen in Baptist church a lot. We could just be singing. The choir could be singing or they could be leading a hymnal song. And sometimes the Spirit of the Lord would come up on you personally, if you're a good faithful church member, and start blessing you. But see, you have to qualify the blessings of God. You understand that? You understand that? Most people don't understand that, don't know how it works. That's just when they say, well, I'm going to the First Methodist Church, or I'm going to the First Baptist Church, or I'm going to this church because the Lord is there. Well, naturally, He's there. I don't care what any kind of church it is. If you preach Jesus on Sunday morning, the Lord is there. You might as well know that. To a degree, and he he's and he wants to he loves those people and he wants to help them as much as he as much as he possibly can, and he will help them as much as he possibly can. But he's but he'll see the Lord. Understand this, folks. Jesus loves you. It just don't make a difference to him if you have any money or don't have any money. 
Or if you don't, if you don't, if you, if you, if you, you never heard of tongues. If you don't believe, if you, you don't even know anything about nothing, hardly. He loves you. And he'll forgive you that quick of all of your sins if you repent. And if you live your life clean, and he forgives you of your sins, comes into your heart. If you don't follow the Lord and live your life clean, you can go to heaven. If you never speak in tongues. Speaking in tongues is not to get you to heaven. The walking on the cross and shedding the blood of Jesus and accepting Jesus as your Savior, that's a ticket to heaven. But you can't accept Jesus as your Savior and then start going back and living in sin. You can't do that. Because the Bible says that sin separates a man from God. And the Bible said if you start if you start committing sin, God will hurt you and he'll work against you. But now if you repent, he'll forgive you. He'll forgive you that quick if you repent. But it's like Brother Hagin told you last night, that if you don't repent, you start doing things your own way, and well, I'm going to follow God, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But you have to watch what you do, because you can shorten your life. 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you can shorten your life. You can't bust a church up and go down the street from that church and start another church. You understand that? You better understand it. You can't split from your church and go down the street and start another church and take members from that church. Well, I mean, you can. A lot of people do it all the time. All the time. But they always have a lot of trouble. They have a lot of trouble. Lots of trouble. Most of the time they die young, you know, 10, 15, 20 years before their time. And don't realize, you know, that what causes what they did to their pastor back years ago when they did that. And of course, the people that follow you, they're as dumb as you are. I can I never understand why a human being would want to follow somebody in a church that want to do the pastor dirty and go down the street and start. If you want to, go, if you want to start a church, go to another town. Go to another town. The only reason you go down, the only reason that a man or a woman would go down the street and start another church is because they're, they're, they're hoping that a lot of those people from their church will follow them. You see, that's the wrong motive to begin with. And so the Holy Ghost is not going to do a lot for you. You can pray until your teeth falls out. He don't even approve of your ministry. He said, well, he's there, though, in the services. Well, yeah, he's there because you present the word. I've seen wicked people preach the gospel, and the, and the Lord will be there to help people. I mean, we Baptists, we don't even, we don't even know anything about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We don't even think about tongues. We don't even know anything about healing. We don't even know anything about casting out devils. No, there's not nothing about it at all. Nothing. I mean, nobody ever taught us anything about that, so we don't know anything about it. But if you'd be standing in the Baptist church, and you stay on Sunday morning and hold a hymnal book and sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, and the Spirit of the Lord will come up on you sometimes and just start blessing you and blessing you and blessing you and blessing you and blessing you. Now, you know what that is? That's a love blessing. Jesus loves that church. But the Spirit of God can come on you and give you a real strong, deep love blessing. But, uh, and I understand this. But he won't heal you. But he'll give you a love blessing. But he won't heal you. The only way he will heal you, the only way the Holy Spirit will heal you, if you're dying with a disease, is for him to hear words that you believe that Jesus put the straps on his back for your healing and that you will call Jesus your healer. Most all churches, they just believe in the ministry of salvation. All churches, they have the Spirit of God with them in the church. But understand this. They have the Spirit of God in the church, there in the ministry, but he'll never do much. The Holy Ghost can live in you for 25 years and uh, or longer and hardly ever do anything for you. He, he, he'll hardly do anything for you. He does what you do. But he will do anything for you, but 
He won't never do anything until he hears something. The Bible says the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, he's a performer, but he only performs what he hears. That's all he does. You, if you go to a cold church and you may love the Lord, the Spirit of God may bless you strong, but he'll never heal you there. If the pastor don't stand up and proclaim Jesus as healer, and he is your healer, and by the stripes of Jesus you are healed, and if you're ashamed to proclaim him as healer in public, he will never heal you in that church. I helped build the First Baptist Church. Now listen, folks. I helped build the First Baptist Church, and we have a good ministry in salvation. Do you understand that? But Jesus has never healed a person in that church, and he never will. You could go in that church for 50 years and want to be healed of cancer or lupus. <clears throat> you will never get it there. There's nothing there to stop that disease. Nothing. There is no ministry there to stop that disease. There's no ministry there to claim Jesus as healer. And God don't do things <clears throat> just because there's something wrong with you. Now, you can have anything you want from God. You can get the Holy Spirit to do anything for you. But he only works with words. Words. He works with words. You have to have a voice. Now, faith, Hebrews 11.1, 1, says, Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, faith is the substance of now faith is the answer of the things that you hope for. Now, let's say that if you're sick or you're dying with cancer, you hope to be healed. Well, your faith is your answer. Your faith is your answer. <clears throat> this morning, I must do my best to get inside of you. Your faith is your answer. Your faith is your answer. We have a special ministry in Crystal River, Florida, I built a church there. I have a home there, and I built a church there about 14 years ago. So we have, I have a rainbow boy pastoring that church. But there's a lady that I, that I trained her years ago. And uh, <clears throat> so we have a special school there. It's called God's Spiritual Hospital, where we take people that's dying and have no hope to live. <clears throat> demon-possessed people, schizophrenics, all kind of <clears throat> cases that most churches can't get help for. They just they don't, they don't take the time. So we have a school that 30 hours, 6 hours a day, 3 hours of the morning, 3 hours in the afternoon, Monday through Friday, we take them and we teach them for 30 hours straight in 5 days. And when that class leaves, they look like a totally different human set of human beings that did them on Monday morning when they came in there. <clears throat> but you have to teach them and you have to have teachers who have been trained to do that. Because you can't even, it's, it's so hard to do, you can't do it unless you're trained, unless you're called and trained to do it, you just can't, there's no way you can do it. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever. Now the Bible says without faith in Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to please him. That it's, but, but without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is God, that he is a rewarder of them that don't really seek him. Now you should read that, study that verse and study it. In other words, but without faith it's impossible to please God. Let's say you're dying with cancer. Well, if you don't have faith in God as, as your healer, it's impossible for you to please him. But if you come to God and you believe that he is a rewarder, that he is a healer, he, then he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So you have to diligently seek him. Now what makes faith work? Well, faith, what makes faith work is a voice. Uh, if there's something wrong with you, I hope to God it's your voice. You understand that? I hope to God it's your voice if there's something wrong with you. Because the Holy Spirit responds to voices. 
to your voice. And you have to, you have to, you just have to know that. So turn with me, please, to chapter 10, the book of Romans. Chapter 10, the book of Romans. And I want to show you something. In verse 8, chapter 10, the book of Romans, verse 8. But what saith it, the word, the word, the Bible, is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. The word is nigh thee, notice that, even in thy mouth. If you don't keep it in your mouth, it won't work for you. And in thy heart, you got to get it in your heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That is the word of faith which we preach. Glory to God forevermore. All right, now I'm going to teach you this morning how it works. Now, folks, now you may go, me and I just spoke the other Sunday in Benny Hinn's church. I've been speaking there for years. I've been speaking to John Osteen's church for years, but I'm Benny's oldest friend in America. I've known Benny since he was 19 years old. I was teaching the Bible in the Full Gospel Business Ministry Convention in Toronto, Canada, way back 20-some years ago. And Benny got saved in a, in a home meeting in, when he was 19. They had never been to a public service, and he, he never heard anybody. They brought him to my service one afternoon teaching for the Full Gospel Business Ministry Convention in Canada. They brought him to the service, and he still laughs about that service. He thought that's the funniest thing he ever heard. Because I told him I said, the devil was crazy. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, when I take authority over the devil, I speak loud. He said, well, what do you speak so loud for when you take authority over the devil? I said, because when I'm talking to cancer, I speak loud because the devil is hard of hearing. He don't want to hear you. He don't want to hear you call Jesus your healer. He don't want to hear you. That's it, be the name of the Lord. Now, one more time, verse 8, Romans 10, verse 8. But what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, in thy heart, the word of faith which we preach. It's in thy mouth. The victory, victory is in thy mouth. That's the best way, to, that's the way you lead people to the Lord. To be born again. Give them to confess the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's been crucified, and he's been raised again from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be saved. Let's go on. All of, you, all of you that don't know how to win a soul one on one, I have a book on my table out there, and also a tape series, a soul winning book, that uh, it'll help you to become a soul winner if you're not a soul winner. But now notice verse 9, Romans 10, verse 9. But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, that God is raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. See, you just get people to say, I'm sorry for my sins, and I believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead, and I believe he lives, and I ask him to forgive you of your sins, and accept him by faith, and he'll forgive you. Now, I'm going to read one of the greatest verses of Scripture in the Bible, because I know John 3.16 is the greatest verse that I can find in the Bible, and there's a lot of other great verses, but I'm going to read you on down here in a minute. One of the great verses in the Bible, if you study it. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And also, folks, you say the Bible, with the mouth, confession is made unto healing. With the mouth, confession is made unto miracles. With the mouth, confession is made unto the salvation of also of your children. If you just keep on praying and keep on praying and keep on calling your child's name before God and keep claiming their salvation, keep claiming their salvation, you'll find out that the Lord will go visit that child or he'll send somebody to visit the child. Now, verse 11, For the Scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, this, this it all works for the same, same people the same way. Verse 12 is one of the greatest verses in the Bible that I can find. 
For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Now you study that. You'll find your answer to everything right there in that verse. There's no such thing as God might not do it for you. Or it's good for somebody else, but not for me. There's no such thing as that. Verse 12 again. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all human beings in the world is rich unto all. Everybody say, all means me. God is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever, anybody in the world, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Blessed be God forever. So we just tell people, well, let's, let's just call upon the name of the Lord. Ask him to save you and forgive you. And I said, he will. He'll come right into your heart. But he, the Lord is rich unto all that call upon his name. It all depends on what you call his name. Always remember this, folks. Jesus has paid the price for everything. And Jesus, Jesus knows how to do everything. So you need to call upon him. Call upon his name. Call upon his name. What does his name mean to you? Well, his name is a healer. Jesus is a healer. He's everything. That could be the name of the Lord forevermore. In the Lord wonderful. All right, now I want you to take some notes and you're going to find out this morning, you know, what kind of faith it works. <clears throat> and I started to tell you, I started to tell you, you may go to, you might go to a Benny Hinn service and you might get healed. Benny has a wonderful healing ministry. And if you don't believe that Jesus heals people at Benny Hinn service, then I'm not, I'm not even sure you're saved. Can you see? Can you look and see? Well, don't he pay all them people to come up and say that? Oh, give me a... He don't have that much money. Give me a break. It's amazing what the devil comes up with to stay away from reality. <laughs> and I would suggest that you go to every Benny Hinn service you possibly can, especially if you're sick. Because... And, uh, I, want, I, want, I want you to get this. I'm going to... I'm going to blast you this morning with reality, but you're going to find out. You're going to find out what the Bible means this morning, and what the Bible should mean to you. And I would suggest that you go to a Brother Hagin's service if he's going to pray for the sick. If you're sick, or anybody else going to pray for the sick, and they have anointing on them, by the laying on of hands, and many has a, a gift of healing, just drops down the congregation and starts healing people. That's all. But he can't make God do that. Sometimes he, he's the only evangelist I know of in the world that sings 40 or 50 songs in one service. He just, they just, they just, they just sang, <clears throat> sang and speak and give testimonies and sang and speak and give testimonies until God comes, that's all. And he'll come. But if you're sick, I would suggest you go to any Benny Hinn service or any healing service that you trust the guy. And uh, I know Benny lives his life clean, brother. And I know he's real. I watched God mold him for all these years. And so, he, because I used to work with Catherine Kuhlman. She had more of God's power with her than any human being I'd ever seen in my lifetime. My God in heaven, I never saw such power in my life. Before or since, I never saw such power. And I'm talking about healing power. I'm talking about miracle power. Even in Catherine Kuhlman's service, and you may be sitting with people like this over here, and all of a sudden, three or four or five or six of them would just jump up out of the wheelchair and run around the church. I've never really seen that. Well, I've seen like one. I've seen some in my, my ministry, and some in Minnie's ministry, and some in Brother Higgins' ministry. But with her ministry, it's all the time, every service she had. It was a beautiful thing. <clears throat> and so, I've been... I've, I've been working with Catherine, and, 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 I, and I would I would work with her like on a, if I worked with her on a Saturday, and, 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 the, and the next Sunday morning I'd be sitting in church, and, and notice a part of my body would still be numb. No, no, no. I'd be like this right here, and I couldn't even feel, feel it. 
I touched myself. And I couldn't even feel myself touching myself. Part of my body is still numb. But uh, of course, it eventually comes back, you know, sometime in the afternoon or the next day or something. <laughs> but but the, if, if you, you say, my brother, no, now, if I go to a Benny Hinn service or if I go to a healing service like that, somebody lays hands on me, what do you think will happen to me? I don't know what will happen to you. I don't know. Well, if I go to a Benny Hinn service, let's take him for an example, and I'm sick. I want to be healed. And I'm sitting in the congregation. Do you think the Lord will heal me? I really don't know if he will or not. I wouldn't promise you he would. And I wouldn't say he wouldn't either. I would say if every service that Benny has is probably two, three, or four hundred people gets healed. There's probably a thousand or six people that don't get healed. Because if you go there, sit in that atmosphere, and the gift of healing has been imparted to him for his ministry, and if you go there, you might get healed. Uh, but you might not. But you might. But you might not. If you go to any healing service, you might get healed too, but you might not. Most of them don't get healed, but a lot of them do get healed. And you might get healed if you go there, but you might not. You understand? Now, when you get over into the Word, though, and you get your mouth connected up with the Word of God. Now listen to me, church. There are no might nots. Not if you'll obey the Lord Jesus Christ. Now every year for the past 15 years, Every Thanksgiving and every Fourth of July week, every one, all week long, Monday through Friday, just like this, three services a day. I have a camp meeting in uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Every Thanksgiving, every Thanksgiving, and I have and I have people with me that that the, the healing ministry works through the ministry real strong. And I used to have a guest with me, you know, this, this past 4th of July, I had Rodney Howard Brown and Hilton Sutton. I've been knowing Hilton for years, but I didn't know Hilton could preach so good. The older he gets, the better he is. He preached like crazy. He really preaches good. Of course, you know, Rodney, he just walks around and talks about God. Walks around, comes up to me and says, I love you, Brother Norval. I love you, Brother Norval. I love you, Brother Norval. And he just gives me all kinds of stuff because he loves me so much. He gave me his watch, you know, and he came to my wedding and brought me a wedding gift of $2,500 and $2,500 check, and he'll do this and do that. Come over to Gatlinburg this past month of July and brought 17 people with him and spoke for me three times. I took up offerings for him and he wouldn't even take the, he wouldn't even take he wouldn't even take no offering. He wouldn't even take no honorary. I said, Rodney, I took these offerings up for you. I want to give them to you. Do you understand me? He said, I love you, Brother Norval. I love you, Brother Norval. In 1986, Brother Hagin called me on the phone, asked me if I'd go to South Africa and, and be one of the speakers for a camp meeting over there at Rama in South Africa. They just built a new church that seats 5,000 people. So I went, and me and Ron Hart Bucky, Benny Hinn, was the speakers in that camp meeting. In 1986, I believe it was. And then 
I was there for two weeks, and Rodney Howard Brown was my car driver. He was assigned to me to drive me for two weeks. So he drove me for two weeks, and of course he'd sit there and listen to me teach all the time. And I thought that a pastor's conference and different stuff, you know, there was different. The first, the first night I was there, they had 5,200 people. I'd never been to the country before in my life. But if you have books, you know, they go all over the world, so they, you know, people read your books and they know you before you ever get there. <clears throat> and he said, your ministry helped me so much and I learned. But he said, but that's to see, you, you have to go somewhere, folks, that people can teach you or show you how, how to do it because you, you cannot do it if you, don't, if you don't go somewhere. You have to find somebody that knows how. Now, the only reason I know how is because the Lord taught me several years ago. That's why that material out there that's entitled How to Live and Not Die is a material that's what I learned, what I learned from seeing is this book out there, How to Live and Not Die, there's a, there's a video out there, How to Live and Not Die, and an audio, How to Live and Not Die. Because the Lord taught me that. Now then, I'll get into the meat of the message now. That So I was in Gatlinburg just a few years ago, about well, maybe it's four or five years ago now. And, and so one night, one night I gave an invitation, and different people came forth, you know, and a man came forth, and and he said, uh, Brother Norville, he said, my wife and me are from Buffalo, New York. And said, uh, she was raised in a denominational church, and she let her listen to some of your tapes, and she didn't like you to begin with because you were too strong and too forward. And said, uh, uh, then after she listened to your tapes for a while, then she says, but the thing of it is about him, I believe he's telling the truth, and I believe he knows what he's talking about. I believe he's telling the truth. He said, now we've took her to all kinds of doctors and all kinds of ministries, and they've prayed for her, and no help. And he said, now that she's come down to life, she's uh, 32 years old, and she's a school teacher in Buffalo, New York school system. She's a school teacher, and she, she has cancer in all four corners of her liver. And said the doctor said there is no hope for her to live. And he said, she, you can see now, here, here she is, she's just skin and bones. And he said that she, the doctor says she has to die, she'll be dead in a few months. So we were talking about it at the house, and I says, well, I tell you what, let's do, and let's go. Now, you've heard of the Norwich tapes, and you've read some of his books, and so forth. Now, he says he can. So let's make a trip to Gatlinburg, his camp meeting, and stay for a week. Stay all week long. Then if you receive no help, then that'll be it, because we've prayed and prayed and tried everybody that we know, and you've received no help. And the doctor says you have to die. There's not even one chance in, not even one chance in 10 million for you to live. There is no such thing as a chance for you to live. Because you have cancer in all four corners of your liver, and you're not going to live, the doctor says. You're going to be dead before long. And we've been married some 10 years, 12 years, and so we got it up on the stage. I said, y'all come up here. They came up there, and I talked to them, and kind of interviewed them in front of the congregation, and told them. I said, now I want you to listen real close. If you listen, you can learn exactly anything Anything that I can get God to do, you can get God to do. I told you verse 12 while ago. See? I listened closely. Verse 12 again. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. But you have to call upon him. You have to have your words correct. So I said to the school teacher, I said, now, you understand, as far as medical science is concerned, uh, you are going to die. Yeah, I understand that part. I said, but now there's one thing, you have to understand this. But now you would not die 
if you had a new liver, right? She said, that's right. I would not die if I had a new liver. She, she said, now, Brother Norval, I've never had a baby for 12 years of marriage. The doctor says, I can't ever have children, and, uh, and I'd like to have a baby. I said, well, well, I don't see any reason why you can't have one. I said, you, you're a school teacher. I said, can you follow the instructions? You being a school teacher, you should be able to follow the instructions. She says, I, I'll follow instructions. I will do anything you tell me to do. Because I used to didn't like to hear you because I was raised in an old cold church and you were just too strong for us denominational people. But I kept listening to you and I told my husband I believe he's telling the truth. And I believe he knows what he's talking about and I believe he's telling the truth. And she said, I will do anything you tell me to do so I can live. I said, well, medical science says you can't live, but I said, the and I said, they're probably tell you, telling you the truth, because if you have cancer in four corners of your liver, you're not going to live from the natural standpoint. But I said, the one thing they don't know, I said, Jesus makes new livers. And he's the only one that makes new livers. Now, you need a new liver. If you could live, have a new liver, you'd live, right. I said, all right, I'm going to teach you exactly how to get a brand new liver. I said, you can have a new liver. Jesus makes them all the time. It's no problem for him to give you a new liver. You just have to show him that you want one. And that you trust him. Because he is faithful unto everybody that calls upon his name. I said, in your case, though, you have to call upon his name as healer. You just call up on Jesus' name in general. General faith don't work for anybody. God likes specific faith, not general faith. Say, well, bless the Lord, I believe God do anything. That's a first class time you don't believe nothing. God won't ever accept that. Well, I believe God do anything. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a first class time. You don't believe anything. You're trying to get by with general faith. And God will not honor general faith. You understand that? If you don't know that, you better learn it. God will not honor general faith. God only honors specific faith. If you're looking for a part in your body, if you're looking for a healing, looking that, then you have to call Jesus your healer. You have to call him a healer, but you have to call him your healer. Not just a healer in general. I believe Jesus can heal. That's not going to get you anything. I believe that Jesus is a healer. That's not going to get you anything, I told you. You have to call him your healer. You have to call him that. That's as I am, that God, that God is faithful unto all that call upon him. And there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. And he is faithful unto all that call upon him. Oh, well, I'll call upon him for help. That's general faith again. Tell him what you want. Well, I need a new liver. Well, tell him! I said, Jesus is a liver maker. And he only is the only liver maker in the universe. All of, he's the only one that's got enough brains to make a liver. Well, no, Brother Norman, I don't think my pastor knows anything about that. Well, why don't you go to church someplace else? Because you can't, you can die there. You can't learn anything from somebody that don't know anything. You understand that? God works with knowledge. You have to increase your knowledge. You can increase your knowledge by going to school. I've had a Bible college for 20 years. We get people to increase your knowledge. You can go to Ram and increase your knowledge in God. If you don't know anything about a healer, then you have to go somewhere and get people to teach you about healing. 
Now, in my camp meetings in, in, in Gatlinburg, and the one in Palm Springs, I think they're August the 18th of this year, August the 18th, I have two people that's my favorites in the world to help me and those concerning healings and miracles and the Holy Ghost. Because I've watched them. And I trust both of them. Now, I didn't know they were here, but I walked over here where I go and happened to see them. They're both sitting over here now. Glory to God forevermore. It's a girl that lives in my hometown that most of you don't know her, but she's the strongest girl minister I've ever seen in my life. She blasts the devil every day, I'm telling you. And it's Elaine Homer and uh, Dave Robinson. Dave, you and Elaine stand up. You see them? They have come and help me in, 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 in the Gatlinburg Convention. Nearly every one of them. Sometimes they miss one, but but uh, you know, they're all of them. They have a strong ministry. Both of them have a strong ministry of the word of knowledge, plus laying on their hands. See, my ministry is in my hands. I don't have a strong ministry in the word of knowledge because the Lord told me, he says, now, son, I won't be showing you what's wrong with people very much. Sometimes I will, but understand, your ministry is in your teaching of my word, and it's in your hands. I will anoint your hands. I want you to lay hands on people. So I have to obey God. You remember what Brother Hagin said last night? Well, every, every minister in the world, every minister in the world, Dave, you make sure you get one of them, Elaine both. That's the message that Brother Hagin brought last night. My God, my God, that's one of the most important messages to the church that I've ever heard in my lifetime. You have got to, you just cannot <clears throat> work against God. You disobey God because he told you last night that you could shorten your life many, many years by disobeying God. Doing what you want to. No, do what the Lord wants you to do. So I told her, I said, I'm going to teach you how to get a new liver. I said, now, you, you understand me? So just come. I want you to listen to me. And just come and just walk with me. And I'll show you exactly how to do it. So I usually just take them by the hand. And I say, now, the only way you teach me is get them to say. I say, everything I say, you say. I tell a, a patient that's dying, that's got lupus or got cancer, everything I say, you say. <clears throat> so I just take them by the hand. And begin to march with them like this. And I say, well, thank you, Jesus, that my name is written in heaven. I said, that thank you, Lord, that I am born again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Jesus, I believe that you are a healer because the Scripture says that you are a healer. I believe you're a miracle worker because the Bible says that you're a miracle worker. The Bible says that healing power is a gift of the church. I don't have to pay for it. It's a gift. Miracles is a gift of the church. I don't have to pay for it. So now that I confess, Jesus, I want to thank you for saving me and writing my name in heaven, but I want to confess, because I believe it, I want to confess, Jesus, that you are my healer. I want to confess, Jesus, that you are my miracle worker. And the doctor says, Lord, I have to die because I've got a bad liver with cancer in four corners of my liver, and I have to die. But I said, you said that all things are possible to him that believeth. And you said, the word of faith is in my mouth, in my mouth. And you are rich to all that call upon you. So, Jesus, I'm calling upon you for a new liver. Jesus, you are the world's best liver maker. You have to say it. If you want to make one for you, you have to say it. Not just believe him in general for a healing. Many times that'll get you nothing. Believing in him. Well, I believe the Lord. You believe the Lord. Yeah, I believe the Lord. That's not believing the Lord. Because you say you believe the Lord. What you call believing the Lord, or what you call believing, most of the time, God does not call believing. He won't even recognize that. You can go out the rest of your life and say, well, I'm believing the Lord. I'm just trusting the Lord. 
I always, I always ask people if they're dying, I say, well, now, now tell me, how are you believing the Lord? And they look at you kind of funny, you know, and bat their eyes two or three times. Well, no, what do you mean, how am I believing the Lord? Nobody ever asked me that before. What, what, what do you mean, how am I believing the Lord? I don't know how I'm believing the Lord. I'm just believing the Lord. And I tell them, there is no such thing as that. That's a statement God won't even hear. There's nothing to that statement. I'm just believing the Lord. How are you believing the Lord? If you say, I said, you believe the Lord, but look up a scripture that covers your case and reminding God of what he said in the Bible. Then you call Jesus. If it's a healing, you call Jesus your healer. If it's a miracle worker, you have to call Jesus your miracle worker. You are my miracle worker. And I said, Jesus' name has all power. And I just told the girl. I said, I believe, and just repeat after me, honey. She said, okay. I said, well, Jesus, your name has all power on earth as it has in heaven. Yes, sir. So I use Jesus' name and I curse all the roots of the cancer that's in my four corners of my liver. I, I curse it in Jesus' name and I command it to die. I'm not asking you anything, cancer. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you and I'm telling you, cancer, you can't live in my li liver. You can't live in my liver. I curse the roots of you and I command the roots of the cancer to die. Die, I said. You can't live in my liver. Cancer, I'm talking to you, and I command you to obey me, cancer. Hey, cancer, hear me. In Jesus' name, I command you, obey me. Cancer, come out of me. In Jesus' name. Cancer, I take authority over you, and I command you, go from me. I command all symptoms of cancer in my liver, in Jesus' name, to fade away and disappear. Thank you, Lord, for a new liver. Thank you, Jesus, you are a miracle worker, and I want to thank you, Lord, for my new liver. No cancer can stay in my liver because I say it can't. The Bible says I can have whatever I say, and I say that no cancer will live in my liver. No cancer can live in my liver because in Jesus' name I take authority over you and I command you, turn my liver loose and come out of it in Jesus' name. You'll usually never be healed of cancer or lupus unless you learn to treat cancer exactly like you treat a rattlesnake. If you came in your house and a rattlesnake was in your house and it crawled up and stuck its head up like this, and it'll watch you just like this. If you get close to it, a person may go. And if it bites you, you're going to get help, you're going to die. But you have to treat cancer or lupus or some disease that's killing you. You have to treat it on the same level as you would a rattlesnake. If you don't, if you don't treat it like you treat, treat, treat a rattlesnake, it won't leave. You have to make cancer leave you. You have to make lupus leave you. You have to talk to it. Twenty-some years ago, when the Lord revealed to me, I shared it with Ken Copeland then. But after the Lord revealed it to me, twenty-some years ago, me and Ken was booked to speak in a men's camp meeting, a men's meeting down at men's camp in Blue Lake, Alabama, up on the lake there, and it's one of these resort-type places. And I told him, I says, Ken, the Lord revealed to me the other day, he told me he wanted me to teach his people how to talk. So the Lord told me that his people did not know how to talk. He wanted me to teach them how to talk. And I told him, I said, I don't even know what you mean. They don't know how to talk. And he said, most of my children, son, the Lord said to me, most of my children do not talk to mountains. And anything that's wrong with them, that is their mountain. They have cancer, that's their mountain. They have bad blood, that's their mountain. They have a bad back, that's their mountain. And he says, the devil's business is to create mountains for my children all the time, create some kind of mountain. The devil would like you to keep climbing mountains all the time with all kinds of diseases, and have to throw your money away for medicine, spend it. All the way. He says, well, I want, you, I, want you to, I want you to start teaching them how to talk. Because I say in the Bible, I tell them exactly what to do in the Bible, but my, my people don't pay any attention to me. 
they just go ahead and do their own thing and build a building and have a steeple and have a church, and they call it church. And he said, son, you don't have to judge churches and have to judge people. He said, that's not your job, the judging people. He said, all you have to do, if you want to know what, where people are at with, with me, he said, just go in anybody's church, I don't care who it is, just go in anybody's church, sit down there in a service, and sit there and watch them. Now, when they get through doing whatever they're doing, he said, all you have to do is just watch me and uh, watch me and what I do. I said, what do you mean what you do? You don't hardly ever show up. Well, he said, if I don't show up and if I don't show up and work in the meeting, you know, I don't I don't approve of what they're doing. They're just doing their own thing. It's set up and made by men's doctrines. I'm not standing on the scriptures, but just by men, men sets it up and makes their own doctrine. So I just bless them all I can. I love them because they love me. Basically, they love me, but they're often, often their own doing, all man's doctrines. That's just when Jesus was speaking one time to a group of people, the Pharisees and Sadducees was there. When he left, the, his disciples came up to him and said, Hey, Jesus, do you remember? He said, Do you know, Jesus, what you did? You offended these people up there. You offended them. They're mad, in other words. You offended them. Jesus said, Oh, really? Well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> the only words I speak is what my father speaks. He said, if I, he said, if I offend them, I don't speak no words except I hear my father speak them first. So he said, if I offend them, they are blind. Now, if you fool around them and go to church where they're at or whatever, you'll be blind. It'll be the leaders of the blind, leading the blind. He says, besides that, who do them people say I am? Who do they think I am? Why, 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 why would you think that I say offend them? Who do they say I am? Well, some of them said that you're John the Baptist. He said, well, I'm not John the Baptist. Well, some of them says you're Elias. Well, I'm not Elias. Well, some of them says you're just one of the old prophets. He said, I'm not one of the old prophets. Then this is disciples. He said, well, who do you say I am? Peter spoke up and said, well, I said that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now then, Peter, I could take a guy like you and build a church. And up on this rock, you shall build my church. Glory to God. And don't let the devil prevail against the church. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So you can bind up the devil, folks. You don't have to take, you don't have to take stuff off the devil. You can bind him up. And I said, now thank you, Jesus, for my new, 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 new liver. I just kept walking with her. Thank you, Lord, my new liver. Cancer, I'm not afraid of you. In Jesus' name, I command you, leave my liver. Lord, I'm going to thank you for giving me a new liver. You are my miracle worker. Jesus, you are my miracle worker. Jesus, you're the best surgeon the world's ever known. Jesus, you're the world's only liver maker. And you're making one for me because I say you are. Jesus, thank you for making me a new liver. Thank you, Lord, for my new liver. Thank you for my new liver. Thank you for my new liver. And I taught her and I said, no. And I, I taught her for quite a while. And I got through. I said, now let me ask you a question. I said, now you're a school teacher. Do you know what you just said? She said, yeah. I said, well, get this tape and memorize it. And I said, will you do it? She says, I'm a school teacher, Brother Noble, and I follow instructions real close. And she says, and I will do it. Now then, before we leave the stage, I want you to ask the Lord to give me a baby. So I prayed and asked the Lord to give her a baby. She could never have, the doctor said, I can never have no children. I said, well, they're probably going to tell you the truth as far as the natural standpoint is concerned, but you have to understand that Jesus is a miracle worker and he can fix your body where you can have a baby. And she says, all right. I said, now let me ask you a question before you leave the stage. Do you have it? Do you have it? I said, you got to do it every day. Every day, every day, every day. The more you do it, the better God likes it. <clears throat> now, did you get that statement? See, the more I thank God for what I need, the better God likes it. When you please, oh, we run out of this tape series. Then we called the office and they sent some more in. Now we've got another shipment of these in. How to please the Lord. Remember, when you please the Lord, you do receive. 
how to please the Lord. Well, the more that you call Jesus your miracle worker or your healer, and the more you thank him for making you a new liver, whatever's wrong with you, the more you thank him. If you thank him, let's take for an example, if you thank him five times a day for giving you a new liver to save your life, well, I mean, he, he, if you thank him for that, he will hear you. But if you want to pay the, pay the price and sacrifice your time and thank him for three hours a day, he would like it better. You'll please him more. All depends on how much you want to please him. I told her, I said, you make sure now that you, you do this every day. Every day, every day, you worship the Lord first. Then after you worship the Lord for a few minutes first, you start calling him your miracle worker. Then you start speaking your liver into existence in Jesus' name. And you start thanking the Lord for giving you a new liver. And you do it every day. You do it every day. Because the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you is a performer. But he only performs what he hears. He only performs what he hears. Now look up here, church. Look up here. I want you to get this. The Holy Spirit of God does all the work on the earth today. All right, now he lives, if you're born again, he lives in your belly. And he's a person that's sent from heaven, but he lives inside of you. But now he only performs, listen closely, he only performs what he hears. Now let me have your attention. If you don't, you'll miss it just as sure as everything. He, the Holy Spirit, only performs what he hears. But if he don't hear anything from you today, no thanksgiving, no appreciation, no nothing today as far as your liver is concerned. If he don't hear anything, he don't do anything. If you take off a day, he takes off a day. If you take off a week, he takes off a week. He don't do anything. He's just there. The Holy Spirit is a person that actually, literally, lives in your belly. And he's just there. Now, he will do anything for anybody that calls upon the name of Jesus. He, the Holy Spirit, will do anything for anybody, anytime, anywhere, any country. He is rich. He is rich. He is rich. He's from heaven. He has the knowledge of heaven. He has the know-how to do everything. He is rich unto all of those that call upon him. But if you don't call upon him, he won't do a thing for you. You might as well know that. He won't do a thing for you. And that's the way people die. They die of sickness, but they don't call upon him. They say at the hospital, take a person and die. And you say to them, let me ask you a question, sir. Uh, but the normal, the doctor says, I've only got about another month to live. I said, well, let me ask you a question, sir. I want to help you. I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to curse this thing in Jesus' name. But let me ask you a question. How many times have you called Jesus your healer today? He says, well, I haven't had it. How many times did you call Jesus your healer last yesterday? No, no. How many times did you call Jesus your miracle worker last week? I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't call him right now. So you're so close to victory, yet you have to die because of a lack of knowledge and the lack of, of, of obedience. You're going to sacrifice your life because of disobedience. Because you're not calling him anything. You're not giving the Holy Spirit that lives in you nothing to work with. He has nothing to work with. Nothing. He can't help you. You might as well forget it. He can't help you. And he's not going to help you either. The only way the Holy Spirit's going to ever help you. You understand me? The only way the Holy Spirit's going to ever help you is if you will say words about Jesus that's true. Like, Jesus is my healer. Jesus is bigger than all cancers. 
Can't you? You're sent from hell and you can't live in me. My body belongs to God and I belong to Jesus. Jesus lives in me. Jesus is my healer. He is my healer. And he's healing me now. The healing power of God is a gift to the church. And I belong to the church. And the healing power of God is flowing through my body now. Right now. And he's driving out all symptoms of cancer. He's driving out all symptoms of disease. And I want to thank you, Lord, because my body is free. I'm free from cancer. Lord, I thank God, cancer, you can't live in me, and you're not going to kill me. You have no right to kill me because I curse you in Jesus' name. You've been, you have been cursed in Jesus' name, and you have to die. Die, I said. And you have to speak to diseases. You have to speak with all kinds of devils with authority. If you don't, they don't listen to you. You have to make diseases leave you. You have to make cancer leave you. You don't ask diseases nothing. You tell them exactly what to do. You have to make them leave you. You have to make them. You have to make them leave. They're not going to. The Holy Spirit is not going to heal you automatically just because you're a Christian and because you go to a full gospel church and because you have a good pastor. But he will do anything for anybody at any time, anywhere, if you'll call upon his name. I said, so now listen, school teacher, I want, I want you to go back home. Now, this is one thing for me to get you on the stage here in Gatlinburg and take you all through that. I said, but do you got it? Do you see it, how it works? She said, I see it. I said, do you believe that the Lord will make your liver new? And she said, oh, yeah, I see it. I see it. I know he will. I said, well, he will if you'll keep your mouth thanking him for it and keep your mouth confessing in that direction. I said, he will. I said, you go back. And I said, now, every day, don't take off a day. Every day, every day. So she went back and I said, make a quality decision. I said, but the, the more, I, let me put this to you, honey. The more you do it, the better he likes it. I said, I'll tell you what I believe. The more you do it, the more you thank him, the quicker you'll get it. I said, but, uh, you know, some people get sick quick and some don't. But I said, the, the, the more you thank God for it, the, the better he likes it. So she goes back home, and she makes a quality decision. She tells her husband, she says, okay. She says, let's make a decision. Let's figure this thing out. She said, I can see it. I can see it. I can see it. So she says, what I'm going to do, I'm, I, I haven't been doing that. I just, I've been dying by degrees. I haven't been doing anything that Brother Norval told me to do. I haven't been doing that. I've been trying to believe God in general through Pentecostal preachers' prayers or some prayer that I prayed or that type of thing. But he says, she said, I can see it. I can see it. And she says, and uh, I'm, I'm, I want God to be rich to me. And I'm going to call upon his name. And I'm going to call his name my healer. And I'm going to call Jesus' name my miracle worker. And I'm going to call Jesus my healer. And she said, now, honey, now listen to me real close and you'll find out why cases there, there is no might nots. With the Holy Ghost in the Bible there's no might nots. In a Benny Hinn service or Brother Hagin service or my service or King Junior service or anybody else's service. You'll have some receive and some won't. Some receive and some won't. You might get a heal but you might not. But you might. But you might not. But you might, though. So you better go to all of them as you can because you might get healed. But you might not. And in this case, there are no might nots if you obey God. Now, you can hear it, but not obey it. So she says, I'm going to, she says, every night I'm, at night time, we've got, we've got more time at night time. She says, at night time, I'm going to walk around our dining, dining room table. I'm going to walk around it two hours every night and I'm going to thank the Lord for a new liver. And I'm going to praise him for a new liver. And I'm going to confess that Jesus is the world's best liver maker. And I'm going to confess that he is making a new liver for me right now. And I'm going to praise him for my new liver two hours every night. Her husband says, okay, all right, honey. Now, that's easier said than done. 
She told me later, she said, some nights I wanted to take off. But her husband was so much in love with her. I mean, he loved that girl, brother. This skinny, this skinny girl, with this, this bones, a little bit of meat. He is nuts about that girl. He said, oh, I love her so much, I can't really stand it. And he said, I see it. And I asked him, I said, now, will you make her? I said, now, most people will get tired of doing this after a while. I said, well, you see that she does it? He said, I, I, I see it, Brother Norville. And he's on the stage. I said, he said, I see it. I'll, I'll make sure she does it. She told me later, she, says, she said, you know, uh, some days I want to take off. And I just sit on the chair and say, I'm not going to do it tonight because I'm too tired. He would come over and pick me up out of the chair and he says, you are going to do it because, he said, Brother Norville said, if you don't do it, the Holy Spirit don't do anything either. He, he rests. Every time you rest, he rests. I said, well, he does. Because he only, he only performs what he hears. You got to give God some words to work with. He works with words. And the more your knowledge is increased in God's words, then the more you'll get, especially if you offer thanksgiving. That's the reason God told you the Bible. Of course, we all forgot it, but we, we all, none, of us, none of us paid attention to that. But, but I, mean, I don't think anybody on earth pays attention to it. I, I never, I've never met a person that did that. God says, forget not to thank me for everything. God gives you and me an order. Forget not to thank me for everything. Well, the only reason, folks, I mean, you might as well be real. The only reason, the only reason, there's not two reasons, the only reason, the only reason that you even have a disease now of any kind is because your body is living with lazy faith and your faith has no voice of thanksgiving. God told you plainly, forget not to thank me for everything. You wouldn't be sick now if you'd have started three or four or five, six years ago. Thanking God for good health every day, every day, every day. Just walk around. Thank you, Lord, for good health. Thank you, Lord, for strength. I confess I am strong and not weak. I confess I am strong and not weak. I confess I am healthy and not sick. I confess I am healthy and not sick. I say I am healthy and I am not sick in Jesus' name. I want to thank you, Lord, for good health. Thank you, Lord, for good health. Hey, Satan, you hear me? Thank you, Lord, for good health. Good health. Health. Hey, Satan, health. 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 The devil don't want to hear you. He don't want you to mention the word health. Because he's not healthy. But Jesus is healthy. And the Holy Spirit, and you might as well know this church, you can't pull no Pentecostal Baptist Methodist church con games on the Holy Ghost. You want to accept that. If you will say what you mean every day, that's exactly what you'll get. If you'll thank God every day for something, <clears throat> then you'll get that. Because he knows exactly where you're at. He knows how many times you thank God. So she came back <clears throat> to the Gatlinburg Convention. I think it was two years. I think they came back in two years. And uh, she came back and <clears throat> she said, well, I've got it, Norval. I said, got what? I said, the doctor says I have a new liver and I have a baby. <clears throat> that little old kid had never seen me. A little kid had never seen me. A little girl, he never seen me. Well, they're standing on the stage, carrying this little kid, this little girl in her arms. She never seen me in her life. And so she's over there, and she that little kid looks at me and goes, and I go, hmm. 
So she, she came to me, and I'm holding her like this, and I'm holding her for a while, and her daddy says, he comes over and just sticks his arms out, and he says, he says, come on, honey. She goes, she goes, mm. Mm. And the mother says, now, honey, you got to come on. You leave Brother Norville alone. You could come on, you know, I'm holding her, you know. And she never saw me before in her life. And she says, and she, and she says come on, honey. She, her mother. And, and the little girl says, eh. mm. And she says, well, there's a kind of congregation just laugh. You know, they try to take their child. That little child wouldn't go to them. The parents. She would have stayed with me. I didn't even know her. <laughs> I had never seen her before in my life. I said, okay, honey. I said, right. She said, I got a new liver, Brother Norval. The doctor said I have a new liver. All cancer disappeared. I said, all right. I said, you should take this microphone. Tell them how you got it. She said, okay. She said, I came here, and I was dying with cancer in four corners of my liver. I was dying, and no hope to live. Not even one chance. Not even one chance in ten million. There was no chance to live, because I had cancer in all four corners of my liver. But then all of a sudden, you on the platform, and he taught me and taught me and taught me exactly what to say and how to say it. And she says, "And I must call Jesus my healer, and what to say and how to say it." Now that audio tape series, the audio tape series, this one here, "How to Live and Not Die," would teach you exactly the same thing. If you don't have one of these in your house, you ought to get one for your own, own family's sake and listen to it again. That first tape playing, that first tape, that's the way Rock Hudson got saved from this tape series. Because he was in his mansion, you know, and he was a homosexual. But the only reason Rock was a homosexual was because, because his, uh, uh, he was a Catholic altar boy when he was eight years old, and the priest molested him when he was eight years old. And his mother got so mad and told him, Look, I don't have anything to do with the Catholic Church no more. No preachers. Forget about God and all that kind of stuff, you know. And so he was such a good looking little boy, you know. And he was, they lived in Illinois. And they moved to Hollywood and Rock got in movies, you know. And I was over in El Paso, Texas. And the Lord told me he, he was there in his house dying. And the Lord says, Go get him a tape recorder and send him two tapes here, please. Give him this one. And the one is, I have another tape series I tried, The Power of Confession. And I said, all right. So I, I called his nurse. I knew one of his nurses that took care of him. She was a Christian. And so I called her. I had her meet me at 7 o'clock in the morning. I flew from El Paso, Texas, just to give her. And, and I said, now, I, I, I asked her, I said, does, does Rock have a small tape recorder? And she says, no, he don't have one. And I said, well, now look. I said, I stopped at Kmart the other day, and I bought me a Panasonic tape recorder. It's got a good sound to it, and I believe it's thirty-five dollars. I said, "All right, now here's your fifty dollars. I'm going to give you fifty dollars. I'm going to give you this tape series and this other one on power of confession. Take them, put them beside a rock's bed, and, and take him a tape recorder." Well, when you're dying and have no hope to live, and this is beside your bed every day. It says, "How to live and not die." You know. After a while, it'll get to you. So she did, she stopped writing the tape recorder. She said the first day she put them out, the first day she said Pat Boone and Shelly was working with him real strong too. And uh, the first day she put it out, and she, he says, what is that? He said, that's some gifts that, that God, that, 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 that a friend of mine sent you. He says, I don't go through do that kind of stuff. She says, well, I'll just leave them here if you want to you listen to them. And so they laid there for about two weeks, and his Rock's boyfriend, who he lived with for years, down in his mansion, he came up and wanted to throw him in the garbage can. She says, no, 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 don't throw him in the garbage can. I'll put him back in my pocketbook. She just took him and put him back in her big pocketbook. And so she, but she said that guy that he lived with, and almost said he never, he never come upstairs when Rock was dying. He may, he may go for a week and never come up there. And and so, uh, she said, I, when I go when I go on my twelve hour shift, I'd put a put I'd put the tape recorder was there and I'd put the two tape series out there by his bed. She said, after about two weeks goes by, one day I 
I was working around there in the room, I heard your voice. And I turned around and Rock had opened this tape recorder and got the first tape. And he turned it and put the tape recorder and he was playing it. And that first tape, the first tape in the series, will really, Mother, it'll bless you. Because it'll believe. He said, and she said, and he was listening real close to what you were saying. Real close. She's like, I kept watching him and watching him, and I saw he was real interested. She said, after, after, oh, maybe 30 minutes, at least of that tape, that first tape, I walked over to him and I said, Mr. Hudson, you know, uh, there's only one way that you could uh, ever be healed. He said, how's that? Doctor says, I can never be healed. <clears throat> he said, well, if God Almighty comes out of the heaven with his power and heals you, that's all you'll ever be healed. He says, well, I, I guess that's right. Doctor says, I can't be healed. And she says, you know, Mr. Hudson, she says, God does a lot more for people when they belong to him. He said, yeah, I guess it does. She says, do you mind if I pray for you? And he said, she said, he's paused for quite a while. He just looked around the room, looked back at me, and he says, you know, I guess it's about time I should start thinking about things like that. He said, okay, you can pray for me. And she said, I prayed for him. And I led him right into the sinner's prayer. He got him to confess and ask the Lord to forgive him. Now, I don't know if you remember this or not, but about two weeks after Rock died, uh, I think it's USA Today come out with a whole page showed a great big spread of Rock's mansion. Big headlines on it says, Rock Hudson said before he died, don't worry about me. I have made my peace with God. Glory to God forever. See, God uses all kinds of things. And she says, she and she told me, she says, Well, I got it. The school teacher said, I got it, Marvel, that day when I was here, I got it. But my husband, we went, went back to Buffalo. And that's another world to get home, folks. This won't work for you unless you pay the price. I'm not going to try to con you and do this and do that. It won't work for you unless you pay the price. She said, I made a decision. She said, I told my husband, I'm going to walk around the dining room table two hours a night. And she said, I started. That lasted for a few nights. I'd walk around the table. Like this right here, dining room table. She said, I'd walk around the table two hours. I'd time myself two hours. I want to give the Lord some quality of time. I say, Jesus, I worship you and I praise your wonderful name. Jesus, I do praise your wonderful name and I worship you. And I believe, Lord, that you are my healer. Jesus, I call you my healer. Jesus, I call you my liver maker. I believe that your healing power is making me a new liver now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. No cancer will kill me in Jesus' name. Jesus, you are my healer. Your healing power is a free gift to me, and your healing power is flowing in my body now, driving out all symptoms of cancer in Jesus' name. Jesus, you are my healer. I want to thank you, Lord, for healing me. Jesus, I want to thank you for giving me a new liver that I can live. Jesus, I want to thank you for giving me a new liver. And she said, I would do that two hours a night. After I did it for several weeks, you know, she says, after a while, she said, I, uh, I, I said, well, I'm going to count them. I walk about the same speed all the time. She said, in two hours, I could walk around my dining room table 740 times. So she said, I averaged about 740 some trips a night, every night, every night, some nights I'd get tired, I don't want to sleep. I'd think, well, I can't, I, I can't walk around it too hard. My husband would come over and pick me up and say, now, you know what Brother Norval said? It don't work unless you do it. The Holy Spirit takes off if you take off. And you're not going to die, honey. I'm not going to let you. 
You are going to do it. In Jesus' name, you are. She said, when I start doing it, I get stronger. I start doing it, I get stronger. I may be weak at the beginning, but I get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And I, I, I confess myself also, like you said, healthy. And she said, I did that, and I'm going to lose you folks. You understand me? Most people will not pay the price. I'm going to basically lose you. She said, I did that for 12 months. Two hours a night, I walked around my dining room table, 700 and some trips a night, thanking the Lord for a new liver, calling Jesus my healer, not getting discouraged. And she said, I did it for 12 months. But she says, now, Brother Norval, in the eighth month, in the eighth month, I began to detect that something was happening in my body. I knew that something was happening in my body. She said, I believe I got a new liver in, by, by the eighth month. She said, I just kept on doing it for 12 months. She said, I went back to the doctor, and he examined me, and he says, oh, no, it can't be. It can't be. He said, you have a brand new liver. You see what I mean? But she paid the price. You understand me? She paid the price. You have to pay the price. Those that diligently seek me, they shall find me. If you'll pay the price and you diligently seek God, you diligently seek the Lord Jesus Christ as your healer, he'll become your healer. But if you nonchalant confess three or four times a day, and this nonchalant, you might as well order the flowers. Get your singer. Get your quartet. Call the pastor you want to preach your funeral. Because you're just as sure dead as everything. God will not honor nonchalant faith. There's two other kind of people that God don't do anything for either. And that's lazy people and stingy people. God don't bless lazy people. He don't bless stingy people either. He'd like to bless you with everything. Everything. But you have to get out of that realm. You have to get out of that realm, folks. You can't do it. Blessed be the name of the Lord God forevermore. Isn't the Lord wonderful? Because he plainly said, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith, which he saith, shall come to pass. Jesus said, He can have whatsoever he saith. And you can, that's his word. Your mouth, folks, is your worst enemy. The devil's not your worst enemy. You are your own worst enemy because of the lack of knowledge and keeping your mouth closed. Because faith, we can speak on faith for a, a year here every morning, but faith has a voice. Faith has a voice. If your faith don't have a voice of victory, a voice of creation, a voice of believing, if your faith don't have that, it'll never work properly for you. You may get a minor, minor ailment healed every once in a while, that type of thing. But there'll be no new livers. You can forget that. There'll be no new hearts. You can forget that. But you can get the Lord to make you a new liver. You can get the Lord to make you a brand new heart. He will make you one just as sure as I'm a man. But you have to learn, folks, exactly what to do and how to do it and the tone of voice to use. You cannot do it. God will not honor your faith. You can thank the Lord and, and confess a new liver all you want to. And if you don't do it with if you don't do it with power, you don't do it with sincerity, if you do it in a nonchalant. Oh, thank you, Lord, for giving me a new liver. Thank you, Lord, for a new liver. Thank you, Lord, for a new liver. What was that now that she said on this search for tomorrow program? What'd she say? Thank you, Lord, for a new liver. Well, you're not gonna get a new liver. You can forget it. You know, even not nonchalant. She walked around the table. Then she came back a year or two later and had another child. Now she's got a little boy. Now that that little old girl, the first one she had, is wearing hats. Funny hats. She brings me a T-shirt that's got dozens and dozens and hundreds of little, 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 little red buffaloes all over it. This is from Buffalo, New York. 
Now then, they come up on the stage, and she says, you can't believe these children, Brother Norval. The, the boy is just like the girl. She says, all during the year, this little boy, he don't even know them. All during the year, they ask me, she says, when are we going to go see Brother Norval? When are we going to see Brother Norval? When are we going to see Brother Norval? She said, we drove from Buffalo, New York, to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and the Great Smoky is there. She says, all the way down here, she says, when are we going to see Brother Norval? How much further is it? When are we going to see Brother Norval? How much further is it? And so she came over, and I'm sitting in the chair now. I'm sitting in the chair. She came over and gets on my knee, and I'm holding her. And that little old boy, he goes, mm, in his father's arms. He says, oh, let me down. Mm. So he gets down. He comes over, tries to climb up on this leg. I had to get him on this leg. Now, the little boy is sitting here, and her daughter is sitting here. They just sit there and look at me. The kids just sit there and look at me. And I say, you want to give me a kiss? They go, uh-huh. I do like this. And they give me a kiss. I say, you want to give me another one? Uh-huh. I do like this. And they give me another one. And she said, you can't believe, Mother Norval, how much these kids love you. Well, I only see them like once a year, once every two years. Then the parents come over, you know. And this, is front, this is front of the camp meeting. The parents come over and try to take them. And both of them goes, ah! Mm. No. The father tried to get him, the mother tried to get him, they go, ah. And the audience would just laugh, boy, they just laugh and laugh. It was so funny. Isn't that amazing now? You pray like the little kids don't even know me. But I had to teach the mother what to do to get pregnant. Thank you. And she walk around the table and once in a while, thank God for that new baby in Jesus' name. So she got it. You know, when you got it, you got it. Now let me ask you a question this morning. From what I've taught you this morning, do you uh, do you know how to do it? Glory to God, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be his holy name. 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 Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right. Now look at what I got in my notes. If I didn't get through teaching, if I got through that quick teaching that one, I don't have time now. I have to close, but I had another case I was going to teach you this morning that was, I didn't even get to pray for her, instruct her. She was dying with lupus. She came to Cleveland, Tennessee at my Bible college auditorium where I was having a special seminar on healing. And she bought this right here at the table. She never did come up for prayer. On the way home, she listened to this. I started doing it. Same thing happened to her. She confessed it lupus, and she's dying in the last stages of lupus. She confessed it 12 months every day and came back lupus and disappeared from her. And God said, now, now listen to this, folks. In Gadsden, Alabama, I was there several years ago, and I didn't know he had it, but I told him what, to, you know, was what I told you and so forth. But that night I spoke on James 5, 14. People said, take this home with you. I want you to thank God. Go to sleep tonight thanking God what you want. Thanking God for it. Now this fellow meets me the next day and he says, Norval, Norval, next night at the meeting, he says, Norval, Norval, wait a minute. I confess last night, I thank God last night for what to, for, 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 my, for, for my miracle. And, I, and I've been praying for, I'm 38 years old. I was born with deformed feet. I said, he said, you know, he said, I, you know, you know, I just, when you walk with club feet, he said, my feet was deformed. My feet was real ugly and deformed. He says, I never did get married because I thought no, no pretty girl would look, look at my ugly feet. And I was so ashamed of him. But he said, you know, that last night when you spoke, he said, uh, when, he, when you told us about it, he says, I, I finally got, I saw it, I saw it in my belly like a, like a light bulb in my belly. And I saw that my healing was in the scriptures, if I had put that scripture. He said, and I went home, and I did exactly what you told me. I listened to you real close. I went home, and I turned out my light, and I began to thank the Lord for my miracle, and I thank the Lord for my miracle. I thank the Lord for my healing. So I went to sleep, like you said. You say, do it till you go to sleep now. I did, but I went to sleep. And I woke up this morning. I'm 38 years old, and I was born with deformed feet. I'm club-footed all my life. Like this, and I woke up this morning, and, and, I, and I put over on the floor, and, and I pushed down to go to the bathroom, uh, and I looked down. He said, 
and I had two new feet. Two new feet. Now, you won't learn that in Baptist Sunday school, I can tell you that. Two new feet. You say, well, I've never heard, Brother Norval, of somebody of God giving a club-footed person two new feet. Well, you've heard of it now. You ever heard of a person going to sleep? You ever heard of a person going to sleep before the club feet? Taking the Lord until you go to sleep for two new feet for your miracle? Well, he did. And woke up with them. In one night, he got him. In one night, the school teacher, twelve months. So your faith may have to work from one night to twelve months. I don't know, or longer. But you just make up your mind that you're going to get what's rightfully yours. And the Lord said, "There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, because the Bible said He, the Lord God, is rich to all." that call upon his name is rich to all that call upon him glory to God forevermore turn your face toward heaven real quick and call upon Jesus right now for victory in your case call on him call on him thank him for what you want thank him call on him God says I am rich to all that call upon my name Call on him for a new liver. Call on him for a new heart. Call on him for a new lung. Call on him. And he will hear you. Call on him. I can't help you. I don't have that kind of power. Call on God. He'll help you. He has all power on earth that he has in heaven. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Lord is rich unto all that call upon Him. Anything I can get from God, you can get it. But you have to call on Him yourself, not somebody for you. You, 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 you. Walk around the table two hours every night, 740 trips a night. Call Jesus your healer. You're a healer. You're a healer. You're a miracle worker. And he'll work for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Well, I believe you believe it. I believe that you believe it. If you show God you believe it, you'll get it. You have to show God that you believe him. You have to show God that you trust him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right. Let me have your attention now. Oh, I believe that you got it. If you, if you've got it, say, Brother Norval, I got it. Bless God forevermore. I got it. Even though we love all ministers doing something for God, but uh, you know, you, you, you get it from them sometimes. But when you come to a place that you will just stand on God's word and the promises of God's word and use Jesus' name, there are no might nots. When you pay the price like the school teacher did, when you pay that kind of a price, you sacrifice that. And you walk around. She said, You know what she said? She said, I walked around my dining room, I walked around my table so much. She said, I wear a path in the carpet. Two hours a night, 740 some trips a night. Thanking the Lord for my new liver. Thanking the Lord for my new Jesus, you are my miracle worker. Thank you, Lord, for my new liver. Two hours a night, every night for uh, 12 months. And a new liver appeared. She said, I believe it appeared in the eighth month, because in the eighth month, I could tell something was happening to me in my body. I could tell God was doing something in my, inside of my body. But I just kept on. I was feeling so good doing it. I just kept on and on and on and on. In 12 months, you have a brand new liver. But that's impossible for medical science, you know. You know, folks, something came to me. This is strong. And I'm going to pass it on to you. You can do what you want to this morning. Worship the Lord any way you want to. But you know, we have never, we have never given really Brother Hagin a birthday gift. Well, I mean, Rainwave did, but I mean, special... But you know, he's 80 years old. Now, he's spent about six or seven years of that in the ministry. I've got four 20s right there in my hand. 80. I want to give Brother Hagin a dollar for every year he's lived on earth. Now, if the Lord will let you do that, let's just show him that we'll give him the best birthday gift he ever got in his life. Will you do that? Some of you, will some of you do that? They can afford it. And if you can't afford it, just give what you want to. You know, write, but you can write a check or whatever you want to do. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, you may be seated. Ushers, bring an envelope. If you hold up, if I got an envelope for your giving, hold up your hand.